Three, two, one, roll the footage. Welcome back, everybody, to the Strategy Sprints podcast. I'm your host, Simon Severino. My guest today is Associate Professor of Psychology at New York University and author of Clearer, Closer, Better, How Successful People See the World. We will talk with the behavioral science of setting goals better. Welcome, everybody, Emily Balsetis. Hi, thank you. <laughs> so cool to have you here. And I just bought this book by chance like one year ago. And now that you are here on the show, I do my research and I see that you are a profound scholar. You <laughs> really research and there is a ton of numbers and real <laughs> research behind this beautiful book. So tell us, um, what are you currently researching? Uh, right now, I've uh, you know I've taken all of this work that my lab has been doing for over 20 years, and all of the great work that's out there being done by other behavioral scientists, and put it into that book. Uh, but now I'm trying to take it to the next level, and um, you know really design these workshops to build the leadership skills and team cohesion, uh, focusing on goal setting and strategies to help people improve the way that they set and and work towards and revamp goals when when they need them uh you know working with large international companies working with small teams within those spaces but then also working with adolescents and teenagers and children so that we're not having to play catch up 20 years too late but it's really setting those foundational skills now um yeah that's that's one of my passions right now and and what was the initial trigger for you, the initial question that brought you to start the research for this book? Really looking at um, why are people struggling to meet their goals? And when you ask outsiders or when I've asked people myself, like, why is this so hard for me? You know, people say things from the outside, like, oh, maybe you don't really care about it that much. And maybe that's not what your true, true interest is. Maybe someone's making you do that. You know, uh, and those are not the right answers. <laughs> so it's not just what it's not just that I have the wrong friends telling me the wrong things. But time and time again, when when we um, when psychologists survey individuals and ask like, what strategies are you using to help you meet your goals? They say the same kinds of things that people said to me. Is I'm trying to encourage myself and talk to myself in, in encouraging ways. I'm trying to remind myself every day of why this goal is so important. And all of these go to strategies that most people use. Um, are great, but they're not sustainable because they take so much concentrated effort. It has to be on the top of your mind and the tip of your tongue every moment of the day. And it's no surprise to behavioral scientists like me who see these strategies and think they've got to be exhausting and these are not sustainable. So is there another way that we can help people identify what some of the sources of their problems are and sort of automate or change their way of pursuing goals to help them overcome those obstacles in a more sustainable manner? Wow, yes, it sounds exhausting. So what is the, what is the less uh, push and the, more, and the more pull way of setting goals. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what we what I've identified in this book are four strategies that are based on the way that we see the world around us. Literally taking advantage of the power of our eyes. We prioritize what we see, we think it represents the way the really the world the world the way it really is. And we make quick decisions based on a scan of what's around us, what opportunities are there, uh, if there's something that we have to react to because it requires our urgent response. Um, and, and so we can take advantage of that great power of our visual experience and use it as a tool to leverage better outcomes. So some of these strategies that I talk about and one that I really started uh, digging into first when I was conducting these experiments in my own lab was the power of narrowed attention. Knowing that you know, we can either pay attention to all of what surrounds us and that's advantageous at times, looking at our, what are all the different pathways forward, what, what are all of the options that are around me, or almost as if putting blinders on. And in some sense, quite literally doing that, like focusing in on what our goal is, what the target is, and when can that be advantageous? So I got this idea first um, in some interviews and, and survey work that I did with Olympic athletes, some of the world's fastest runners in the world. 
And I wondered, I wonder what the, what are they looking at as they're racing towards the finish line? Is there something about these incredibly successful individuals that's unique to, to their experience? I thought probably they have like, you know, almost like eyes on the back of their head, peripheral vision that they can use. And they don't. They say that they narrowly focus on the finish line. They don't really pay attention to where all the other runners are. And then, and that narrowed focus was surprising to me. I, you know, that's not what my intuition would be. And I wondered if it wasn't the intuition for other people. And I found that that's the case. People who struggle to exercise or struggle with other goals tend to tend to take on a broader perspective than would be ideal in most circumstances. So we've done 20 years of work showing that when we get people to narrow their focus of attention, to disregard you know, details that are in the periphery, we can get people in the context of running, for instance, to move faster, uh, to say it hurts less, and then to repeat it over and over again. It's a strategy that helps build a really effective habit um, that, that can promote engagement for the long run. And this isn't specific to just exercise either. We can talk about other ways that, you know, distance comes into play, like time and overcoming time and, and making choices today that will benefit me in the far off, long run, distant future. When we take that approach of a narrowed focus, we can contract that space and make the far off future seem more relevant to the decisions that I'm making in the here and now. So there's broad reaching applications of, of, of training ourselves to either focus in when we need to, quite literally with our visual experience, or to broaden out in other times when that would be advantageous. And we can build that skill. Uh, and we can see improvements in all kinds of domains in many different types of goals beyond those that are just related to exercise. Wow, that's powerful. So visualizing and narrowing down mm -hmm. and focusing all the rest. And if I think of myself, I, I was struggling to create um, daily content and to write every day. But as soon as I narrow down the, the two topics that I allow myself to write about, it became much easier because now I have just these two topics. I really don't have to think about it. And uh, it happens because um, e life happens. And through this filter, I will find something about that to talk every day. That's powerful, visualizing. What else did you find out that did maybe surprise you? Well, there's great power in materializing, and that is literally taking what we might leave in our minds to our memories and instead making it concrete, visual, visible right before us. So like you talk about writing and the struggles of writing and narrowing in on just a subtopic was really helpful. And importantly, like you saw the, the product of that output. It wasn't just that you were stewing or brewing, letting, letting one idea sort of uh, foment in your mind, it's that you were doing that work of writing it out. Now, I when I was um, when I when I was writing this book, I had my own struggles, th those like you said, but my own as well, because I also decided that I want to try all these tactics out on myself. I wanted to know if I'm telling people to do this and the science says that this should work. Like, what's the real deal? Like, if I did it myself, is it going to work on somebody like me who has this knowledge or who's just also like a normal person who struggles to meet their own goals? So I decided in this book that I wanted to take it on, on a challenge for myself, and that was to learn to play drums, play one rock song, really nail it because I wanted to be cool. I had just had a baby. I was writing this book. I'm a scientist. People have stereotypes about scientists. And I just wanted some coolness back in my life. And I thought, you know what, if I can be a rock drummer, even if I'm a one hit wonder, I, I bet that'll bring me a little bit more coolness or at least all think that I'm cooler. But that was a lot to take on and put on my plate all at one time. And but I had committed to it and I told my editor, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to play a show for people uh, and, and it's going to be my make it or break it moment. If I don't learn how to play drums, if I can't figure out what strategies work for me, then I'm going to be a total embarrassment. And what I realized through the course of this is that it felt like I was making no progress on this long-term goal. I didn't know how to play drums. I'm really uncoordinated. And, um, and I needed to figure out something that would work. And for me, that was notating not only if I practiced, when I practiced, for how long I practiced, but also how did that experience go for me? What did I think? If I gave myself a grade on this practice session, what did that look like? And 
because uh, in the moment, what I felt like is I'm not carving out enough time. I'm feeling the anxiety building of this big goal that doesn't feel like I'm I'm much closer than I was yesterday. And I just think that I stink. I sound terrible. And that was really demotivating. But once I started materializing, taking notes of when, how long, how often those practice sessions lasted, but also my grade, how my my thoughts about how I did, and then look at that after a month, I realized that there was a great trajectory of improvement that in the moment I couldn't experience. So I needed to materialize that. I needed to take those notes, create data on myself, and then reflect on it over a longer uh, span of time. And when I could see that data uh, of my own experience, it gave me a different appreciation and understanding of where I was in the course of trying to pursue this goal. And again, that comes down to this great power of visualizing, of seeing, of materializing, and not just relying on our memory, because our memories, as we all know, are fallible. They're full of errors. Now, from experience, I think everybody everybody can feel it, that when you start noting down, then it, it becomes easier. And, and you are the only person that I can ask also the science behind it. Mm -hmm. so, what happens when we write down an experience in our mind, in our body? It, yeah, it increases the accuracy of our memory. Because I bet you when you just said like it makes it easier, that's true for some people in some instances, but it's not true all the time. And that's because what we remember is a filtered version of ourselves. We remember those things that are good memories. If we've had something that was an embarrassing moment, we try to push it away. We wanna forget about that. If something didn't go right, and then we later improve upon it, we, Gonna, we're going to remember those improvements much more so than the, we're going to remember the ways that we faltered along the way. And for the most part, that's that's good for us. It helps us maintain a sense of motivation, a positivity, a high, high self-esteem. But it can do us a disservice when we're trying to decide what we should do next. And what's the likelihood of success if we go this route? Where are we going to experience obstacles? So our memory helps, helps us <laughs> think well of ourselves, but it might not be great when we're trying to have the most data to make the most informed decision about the best course of action. In thinking through these ideas, I came upon a really cool app. It's called One Second Every Day. Maybe you've heard about it. It's actually one of the most downloaded apps um, in recent times. And it's an app that engages or asks you to take one second take a one second video every day of your life. And, and then, you know, whenever you want, it'll stitch together and make a compilation, make a movie of all your memories. And when I was digging into the neuroscience of what's happening when people watch their own movies, some people have done brain scans of individuals who are watching their own one second every day movie clips. Uh, and when I talked with I, I cannot, um, economists and behavioral, behavioral scientists about what's going on, what is great about this app is that not every day is amazing. You're not a rock star every day. And if you are really committed to using this app for its intended purpose, there's gonna be some moments um, that aren't so great that you're gonna capture. In fact, the creator of the app said his most favorite one second clip is of a wall. It's a movie of a wall. And I was like, what, why, like, what is that about? Why a wall? He says, it's really boring. It would mean nothing to you, but it means the world to me because that one second was the moment after I walked out of the emergency room. It's the first thing, that wall is the first thing I saw after I learned that my sister-in-law uh, was on the brink of, of death from really rare form of intestinal twisting that nearly killed her in this, you know, a really unforeseen way. And that's when our family learned that this might happen, that this is what she was experiencing. And that wall, reminds me of the fragility of family, the importance of savoring every minute. And that, and every time I see that wall in my video, I'm reminded of that. Stay grounded in the moment because you don't know when life is gonna change. She lived through that experience, their family is fine. But it is that reminder, you know, a horrible moment that most of us probably wanna just find a way to let go of those emotions. You're not gonna forget that that happened, but you don't wanna continue to relive those emotions um, but he does, and he wants that reminder because of the meaning that he took out of it. And that's the same, you know, that is an extreme experience, of course, but that's the same for all of us, is that our memories will try to filter out the bad and hold on to the good, but that might not be helpful when we're trying to decide what should we do tomorrow. It's probably a good thing if we remember, like, this restaurant gave me food poisoning, so I'm probably not going to go back to that restaurant. And that makes sense to us of like, oh, there's power in negative information and negative memories. 
But if our mind is constantly trying to filter out those negative experiences, we increase the odds that we're going to make a bad choice. So by materializing, writing it down and, and keeping a real account of our lived experiences, like I did when I was trying to learn the drums, we can get a better sense of our progress over time. Where am I really at? Am I actually making any improvements or am I not? And if we just rely on our memories, we might not get the right take. We might not come up with the right conclusion. When should we journal? How should we journal? Is there, is there a difference in, in how and when to do it? I think you should do it the way that it works for you. So, you know, there's lots of different styles. Some people really do like putting pen to paper, going analog. And in COVID times, I actually have found great value in that too. I feel like, you know, keeping electronic to-do lists um, hasn't really been helpful for me because first of all, those to-do lists never drop down to zero. There's never a day when there's nothing to do or I've, you know, accomplished everything. But especially with electronic to-do lists or journaling, once you've done it, it's deleted. And so you don't get that opportunity to reflect on your progress, how much you've accomplished. But if you literally write it down in a daily journal, this is what I wanted to do, check it off, I got it done. And then at, you know, at the beginning of each month, just flip through those pages from the past, you can get a real jolt of excitement. I'm like, look what I got done. And it, today it feels overwhelming. And, it still have so much to do, but look at how much I actually did accomplish. So writing it down is a good way to do it. When people are looking at, you know, trying to track their financial expenses, it can be, you know, great to just download the data from whatever credit card companies you're using or your bank statements so that you can get the overall picture. That's been really helpful for individuals to make great strides on cutting down on, uh, on the debt that they're experiencing. Um, and I just, you know, whatever way that you enjoy doing it, that's the way to do it. Because if you're going to try to, you know, improve the odds that you meet a goal by adding on a responsibility that you're not actually into, that's not going to be sustainable over time. I'm so curious who you pick for the strategy award after one word from our sponsors. Hey, if you love what you are hearing, you will love our free masterclasses. Go grab them at strategiesprints.com. When everybody zigs, this person is zagging. But from your perspective, they are doing the right thing. Who do you pick? Well, his name is Giorgio Piccoli. He's actually a longtime friend of mine now, um, has been a longtime friend, but he's the founder and CEO of American Flat. This is an amazing company that uh, curates museum quality art, but prices it for beginning investors. In the first seven years of it being open, they've, uh, they did over $20 million in sales in all the continents that they were working in and proceeds of every single sale go back directly to the artists that collaborate. He's also come up with this amazing distribution system that allows or is capable of on-demand printing in all the countries that it works in. And so I just, and he started this when he was 27 years old. He's older now, um, but he's just done incredible things right off the bat. And when I, I had a conversation with him uh, recently and I was asking him like, you know, what do you do? What are some great habits that, that you use that you feel are really critical to this creative innovation um, that's at the heart of this business that, uh, you know, it, that I think is super cool. And he, what he said is that every day, for over 10 years, every single day, he makes a list of 10 things. It could be like 10 ways to improve the experience of flying for people that are in a wheelchair or 10 things people don't like about picture frames or 10 company mashups. Like what if Rosetta Stone and uh, Google Maps got together? What would happen? And, and he practices this. This is a habit of his that he has sustained and not missed a single day in well over 10 years. And he said he writes it down and he showed me how where he writes it down and he keeps a, a record of it in his phone and scrolling through all these amazing lists. And I was like, okay, this is cool. Has it ever turned into something lucrative? And he said, sometimes, but mostly not. And then I was like, well, then why are you doing this? Why would you do this thing that actually probably isn't critical to, to your business plans? And he said, you, you have to do it. You have to build this habit. And I said, well, then can't you just do it like in the shower or something like that, get it out of the way? And he said, no, you have to write it down. 
he really felt that that process of materializing, seeing the big picture, training yourself in this creative thinking and practicing accountability by seeing all that he has done today, but also this week, this month, this year, this decade is, is critical. It's a, it's a way that he has created a habit to practice creativity and, and problem solving. And that basic skill building is what he thinks is responsible for some of these creative solutions within his within his business that he's um, that he's solved. Cool. Now you are a writer and also a reader. What are three books that touched you most? Mm. Uh, so I do I do love reading fiction, and I've always got something of that sort going on. But uh, when I went. When I want influence, really, I turn to behavioral science. So Adam Alter, uh, he has a couple New York Times bestsellers. His most recent book, Irresistible, is great for if you want to understand addiction um, and and what is eating away at our time in ways that we don't even know. He has a, he has a really deep dive and an exciting read uh, on that. Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton, they have a book that's been out for a while now called Happy Money. I have read this book so many times. It's about how you actually can spend money to buy happiness. It's just that you do it. We, we don't do it the right way for the most part. Uh, and I just find, you know, when I'm when when I need a little jolt of positivity in my life, there are concrete action plans in there for how you can buy your own happiness. And that is possible. Uh, and then as a different, you know, sort of outside of behavioral science, but also kind of inside, um, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, Charlie Munger, he put out a while ago a book, Poor Charlie's Almanac. And what's great about, about Charlie Munger is that he is sort of a self-study in behavioral science. Before that even existed as a field, he would just read everything he could, like, uh, what are the what are the strategies that Alcoholics Anonymous as a program has used that help people curb addiction? What is the training program that fighter pilots go through? Uh, what do oil company executives do that's similar to what big tech firms use? And what are those strategies that work and what gets in their way? And so he's created, a, you know, 20 different errors of human judgment. Uh, before scientists even noted what they were. And he put pen to paper and created this book that notates them all. And it also has amazing case studies of great companies that have uh, experienced the successes and the pitfalls that relate to the behavioral science that he has discovered. But it's also got cartoons in it, which is, which is pretty funny. <laughs> um, funny that it is a picture book, but he, he put them in there and he thought it was really key to, to learning because he thought that there is power and visualization. And that if we can see a cartoon as we're reading the case study and, and learning this you know, psychological behavioral science concept, then people will remember it better. That, there's, that those cartoons actually are the greatest source of inspiration for learning. So I just love how he's, you know, that book pulls together all of the things that I'm passionate about. Super cool. In terms of book promotion, what did you learn about promoting your book that maybe surprised you? Talk to everybody. That's not really a surprise, but it's something that I really enjoyed about the experience of every opportunity you get to share your message. It's gonna, you know, have a butterfly effect, effect first of all, but you never know whose life is gonna get changed and how you'll come across that person. So I, you know, COVID times have been really hard, if not actually impossible, to get to do real book tours. But the advantage is that I get to connect with with groups and reading clubs and and companies and individuals all over the world so easily and share this message really broadly and um, to see who comes back and, and has found some meaning and, and what I've said and how it's changed their life has just been so rewarding. And, and I'm really glad for for the opportunity to share it so broadly. Yeah, you're getting some thank yous here in the chat. And how did your life change after researching and, and finding these things. Is there anything that that sticks now that was not there before? Well my drumming skills, first of all, stuck. I did learn that song. I did play it, I did play it for people that were family, but also strangers. 
And uh, I've made, because I worked so hard to get that song down, I haven't forgotten it. So if anybody needs, you know, a backup drummer for one song, um, I'm there. <laughs> but in terms of, of the science that's in the book, what really has stuck with me is understanding flexibility, the importance of flexibility. There is no formula for how you should set a goal, how you should work towards it. That is going to be the, you know, billion dollar solution to, to the scope of this problem. That doesn't exist. Every person is different. Every situation can be different. And what we need to do is really build out our toolbox um, and be more flexible in in what we, what tactics we try to use. And that's what I what that's what I went for in this book. And that's what's really stuck with me is that you know you can't build a house with just a hammer. We need a bunch of tools in our toolbox. The same goes with our goals. We need a bunch of strategies and tactics that we can turn to, and have an open mindedness and a flexibility to drop our usual course of action and try something new when we're up against a roadblock. And that's been the thing that I think has resonated with me most. Beautiful. Where do you hang out? Where can people find you? Uh, all of the writing that I do, um, I post on my LinkedIn um, channel. So you can check it out there if you want to read more uh, and see see where else you can you can catch up with me. Super cool. One last question from the audience. I have a problem with focus, reading. <laughs> Any advice? Start with what you love. Train up that train up a good habit. So you know, if there's a style, a genre, an author that you love, indulge, right? Don't feel like I have to read this if it's if you're using the word have to. Do something that you love and then you'll build up the skills to try something that's a little bit more outside of your comfort zone. Super cool. And who should be my next guest? I would recommend Aaron Dimmock. He is he has amazing a backstory. He is a former Navy pilot. He has led so many incredible um, missions. He was a senior advisor to the U.S. Department of the Navy, and now he's working on strategic planning and leadership building. He's uh, he's got an an incredible resume, but also a deep understanding based on all of his experiences and the different forms and types of teams that he's um, that that he's led on candor and how to build the strongest, most effective uh, teams that are possible. I have learned so much by engaging with him and, and brought him in to work with my team too. There's so many concrete, amazing suggestions that he has on how to how to hone the, the best coordinated team. Wow, thank you so much, Emily, for being here, sharing your book, Clear, Closer, Better, your journey, your wisdom with us. And please come back soon. Thank you. Avoid trying to do thousands of things that doesn't work. We have 274 templates for your business success. Reach your ambitious goals with one-on-one -on -one sprint coach. We double your revenue in 90 days.